If there's one thing that's clear in 2019, it's this. The young Australian FIA Formula 3 driver, Alex Peroni, was incredibly lucky to escape from a huge accident at Monza with only a broken vertebra. It was towards the end of the Saturday morning race on September 7 when Alex ran wide at the Parabolica in his Campo Stellara. Competitive from the start, he was now under a lot of pressure from Trident's Pedro Pique, who was much quicker on the straights. Alex was having to push very hard in the middle sector. His Pirellis had degraded dramatically. He locked up under braking for the first chicane, but held the moment. And then, going into the Parabolica, Alex ran wide. He got onto the curbs on the outside and tried to ease the car back onto the track, staying on the throttle. He hit a raised, rounded, sausage-shaped curb at the wrong speed and the wrong angle. Of course, Alex knew that that curb was there, but like most other drivers, like all other drivers that weekend, and indeed in years past, you've been able to hit the curb, have a big bump, and get away with it. The car wouldn't have been launched in the air. It was just that on this moment, he hit it at exactly the speed and the angle that would turn his car into a missile. The interesting thing is that that sausage curb was removed from the outside of the Parabolica immediately after Peroni's accident. The next session was indeed FP3 for Formula One which is kind of strange because the curb itself, the height of the curb and the radius of the curb is actually designed around a Formula One car. It's designed not to launch a Formula One car, only to hinder it. And that's because a Formula One car has a relatively high ride height at the rear. Let's call it the rake aspect of the car. And beyond that at the front, it has a suspended T-tray. So when the Formula One car hits the sausage curb, there is a nasty shock for the driver and for the under tray of the car, but it doesn't launch a Formula One car or hasn't done so far. The problem, of course, is the compromise that is characteristic of our world of motorsport. We can talk about it in terms of rallying versus racing, in terms of motorbikes versus cars. But now it's extended, of course, to Formula 3 and Formula 2 cars and Formula 1 cars. And that's because F3 and F2 cars built by Dallara have a much lower ride height. And that's because they're looking to run as much downforce as possible. The lower you run the car, the higher the downforce level. Let's call it cheap downforce, a cheap way of getting downforce into the car. So I've been asking quite a lot of authorities why we use only sausage curbs. There must be a better solution to the policing, the enforcing of track limits. Well, the answer comes back, well, we've tried several things, but it is the most foolproof. It is the best way of doing it. Well, I just don't buy that. And the reason I say that is because recently I attended a round of the British BRDC Formula 3 Championship at Brands Hatch, and they have sensor cells in the curbs on the outside of strategic corners. And these are linked to the transponders on the cars. And it looks to me to be a pretty foolproof system. Now, why that hasn't been adopted across the board is another question, and I guess will be the subject of another video when we get responses to this one. We went through many different uh, ideas about using lasers and, and fronds and all sorts of things. And uh, eventually we decided that the best thing to, would be a, a sensor pad in the circuit. And we designed a server-based system uh, which would allow us to manage, monitor, and produce the evidence that was necessary, obviously, to prove the track limits incidents to the drivers who aren't always the most um, understanding, shall we say. So what it is, is a, a piece of really heavy RSJ con uh, concreted into the kerb at the side of the circuit um, with a cap, with a, a thick six millimetre galvanised steel cap on it and it's all anchored down really hard and underneath the galvanised steel cap is our sensor which is an accelerometer um, with a, uh, a little uh, uh, condition monitoring system inside it because it gets pretty cold and pretty wet and miserable down <laughs> by the side of the circuit. Um, and the impact of the vehicle is enough for the accelerometer to sense the, uh, the impact. It's, it's adjustable, so uh, from the controller's console, he is able to, or he or she, uh, are able to adjust the sensitivity for different disciplines. Because obviously, if it's a truck, it's going to hit a lot harder than, a, for example, an open wheel uh, vehicle where the, the, the axle might not impose that much 
uh, uh, way, you know. We also have a, um, uh, an RFID uh, coil in the track which picks up the transponder ID. So the, the software box at the, uh, rather the hardware box and the software that's running in it at the track side is collecting the incident. It's, it's, um, it's passing the incident to filter out other vehicles that might be passing at the same time, but not going over the pad. It's collecting the RFID uh, from the transponder and then it wraps it all up, sends it to the server. The server turns it into an incident with a series of images, the car ID, the driver ID, uh, and it presents it with a timestamp so that the moderator can look at the incident and decide what caused it. Uh, because there, there does have to be moderation. The, uh, a track limit incident is not an incident if it's an accident. You know, if it's, a, if it's just a, a skid, a driving error, uh, which has, and hasn't, uh, and it hasn't caused the car to um, take any advantage, then of course it's not really a track limit. It's there to catch drivers that are, are exceeding the bounds of the circuit for a racing advantage. It's just a case of making it absolutely bomb-proof at the business end. From a software point of view, not really any issues at all. We have a direct link with uh, TSL, the timing company. So as the uh, as the uh, uh, the grid is changed, you know, people come, I mean, the p people drop out or whatever. Uh, and the the live link automatically changes on our system so that we're picking up the correct cars and the correct drivers. We, you know, we ha we accommodate multiple drivers in the same car, and um, and so it's it's very and the mo most importantly, it's quick. You know the process of moderation is really quick and it's really accurate so that the person who's responsible for, for looking after it doesn't have to hang around. The three turns here at Brands which are the ones where everybody runs out or used to run out were Paddock, Druids and Graham Hill and so they were the turns which were regarded as most important. I think the thing, I think the thing that's been missed really um, uh, is that um, uh, television could actually benefit from uh, from having track limits images as part of the experience of watching the race, you know, because uh, it gets mentioned in the broadcast, but you never see the image of the car hitting the pad, and um, and of course we could deliver that easily. It's just there; it's on the server. So it would be really nice if the broadcasters, you know, linked into us and just picked up the image when they wanted it. And one thing should never be understated. Much credit should go to the FIA and to Delara for the safety structures they have within those cars. Sophia Flersch was very lucky to survive as well when she hit a sausage curve and was launched at Macau in 2018. And Alex Peroni's car, by any standards, stood up to the impact incredibly well. But it's upon the cause of accidents like Alex Peroni's and Sophia Flersch's that we now need to focus. And the SPL system, proven on the British circuits run by MSV, look to be a very good solution. They may not be bulletproof, nothing in racing is these days, but one thing's for sure, they're much safer than sausage curbs. Mm -hmm.